This morning, we warmly welcome everyone who is here this morning in our sanctuary. And for those of you who are worshiping with us, wherever you are there online as well. This is traditionally our Stewardship Sunday. We also have a congregational meeting that will occur uh, directly after worship today. We'll have about a five-minute break. Uh, you'll be presented with the budget, terms of call, and the slate of officers for 2024. So I would ask you to be in prayer for that meeting too as well. And after that meeting, there's a wonderful luncheon that's being prepared. So please make time to stay and to join together in food and in fellowship. If you brought your pledge card today, uh, Sandy Earl, who's back there at the door, has a basket, and she can take your card, put in that basket. We'll be dedicating those um, during the pastoral prayer today, too. We have the angel tree, and Annie would like to come up and give us a few words about the angel tree. As you can see, it's right back there by the door. Miss Annie, you want to come on up here to to our lectern, if you will. It's such a fancy word, isn't it? Lectern. Say a few words about the angel tree. Thank you. In case you missed that, Sandy did point to our tree we brought inside the sanctuary for a while here in the back. I heard a conversation between two people one asked the other, um, why do you give so much of your time and your money to others? Why are you always doing and giving? And the answer came that I met the Lord Jesus Christ. I really met him. It's not a religion. I met him. And he was the greatest gift. And so I give my time, my money. I thought that was a really, really good explanation of why so many of us give our time. Because we don't give it just to people. We do it as unto the Lord. And he's the one that's going to pay us. So think of that when you're asked to give. Now, if you don't want to participate in the angel tree, um, pray for those who will. Our angel tree this year is through people in need. We have, <clears throat> excuse me, 25 youth that need help. And we want to bless them, especially for Christmas. So you can get your angel, sign your name, so that if you forget that you have the angel, we can call you, and a child won't go without, because we only have 25 this year. So please put your name down. Sandy will help you. If she's not there, I will help you. They are not. For I, have, I bring you tidings of great joy. I thought that was wonderful. That is beautiful. Thank it. you. Yes, so what the angels say, right? Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, Pastor Roy, I also want to mention in giving, we had almost 70, way over 60, for Thanksgiving dinner here yesterday at Glory Grill. So give those deacons a hand, would you please? Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Les, of course, just got a new knee. There he is, and he was cooking. I mean, I'm impressed. Yeah, that's impressive. Thank you. Um, and yes, please be in prayer. If you don't participate in some physical way, participate in a spiritual way. Pray for those youth and their family and all of those who give and contribute in such wonderful and beautiful ways. Also, my brothers and sisters, the new Advent devotional is available today. Please pick one up for your family. It actually starts on November 24th, I believe, in this particular book, Carries You Through Christmas. And it's a wonderful um, book of 
all kinds of different writers from Bonhoeffer to Dillard to Luther and Merton to Andreal Yancey and many, many more. So please take advantage of this book and I thank the Education Committee for underwriting the cost so that there's no cost to the congregation and you can all have that book. Uh, please note too, the office is closed on Wednesday for Thanksgiving. And next week, um, Annie will be covering pastoral call for me as Daniel and I will be out of town with family. So my brothers and sisters, as we prepare to meet our loving God in worship today, I invite you to turn your mind and your heart to Jesus Christ, who stands at the door of our heart and who knocks. And when we open that door and we invite him in, he has promised to come and be with us and to dwell within us. And so my brothers and sisters in Christ, I invite you now to open your hearts and open your minds as we begin to worship God. There is a truth older than the ages There's a promise of things yet to come there is one born for our salvation he's jesus jesus who walks on the water he speaks to the sea he stands in the fire beside Please join me in prayer. Loving and holy God, we thank you and praise you for this time of worship, this time to be together as one body in Christ Jesus. We thank you that no matter what our prayer is, that you hear it, no matter the praise, you accept it. And so we ask that your Holy Spirit would descend upon our mind, anoint our mind, anoint the prayers and the praise of our lips, anoint the passion for you in our hearts and root us ever more deeply within the reality of you, of your grace, of your peace, of your love for all of us. May this time of worship be a time of great blessing for you and for us. May we leave this place changed. In Christ's name, we thank you. We do praise you. Amen and amen. My brothers and sisters, please stand and join together in our opening song of praise, Morning Has Broken. You can find it as the bulletin insert and words on the screen. Morning has broken like the first morning.
then before we take a seat, please turn to someone near to you and offer them the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. God's peace be with you. God's peace be with you. As you find your way to your seat, I'm going to take a moment to recognize that we uh, silently confess our sin in community because it also helps us to recognize we are all in need of forgiveness and mercy. And as we accept these gifts from God, we in turn are called to extend them just as grace graciously and easily to one another. So my brothers and sisters, I invite you now to join together in our prayer of humility, which you can find printed in the bulletin and also on the screen. Merciful God, forgive us when we invest our energies into increasing our personal prosperity rather than enriching people's lives with the good news of Jesus Christ. And when we squander our gifts by failing to use them to build people up, forgive us when we conceal the wideness of your mercy by our lack of compassionate behavior. Forgive us when we fail to be adventurous in spreading the gospel. Increase our capacity to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ in word and in deed, even if this means taking risks and expending whatever energy we may have. Help us to hear Jesus' words addressed to us about being eager to share the spiritual treasure that we have, knowing that as we do, more, much more will be given. Hear us now as we silently confess our sins to you. In Christ Jesus, we ask these things. Amen and amen. My brothers and sisters, God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 to 11. In the knowledge that in Jesus Christ we are enriched, we are loved, we are forgiven. Please join together in our baptismal promises. Through the waters of baptism, we have died with Christ and are raised with him. With gratitude and with faith, we will walk the way of Christ. And this is the good news of the gospel, that in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Please stand. be seated. The first reading is from the Hebrew Bible, Judges 4, verses 1 through 7. The Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. So the Lord sold them into the hand of King Jabin of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harosheth HaGoim. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron and had oppressed the Israelites cruelly 20 years. At that time, Deborah, a prophet, 
wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Position yourself at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Zebulun. I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the Wadi Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. The second scripture is Paul's letter to the first Thessalonians, chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and there will be no escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then, let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. that was rather impressive, Wendy, that you got every one of those words. <laughs> so well done. That's why we chose you that one. Yeah. All right. But it's important that we recognize that um, the church in its great wisdom, the Big C Church, puts together these readings, especially in this time of the year, for a reason. So as we prepare to be open to that reason, I invite you to recognize the power of Christ Jesus that is upon you and within you through the power of his Holy Spirit as you settle yourself ever more deeply within that reality and allow that power to speak to your mind, to your spirit, to your heart, to your soul. And we thank you, loving God, for this living word, for its truth that we believe still speaks to us today. May we be open to that truth accept that truth, allow it to transform our lives so that we may carry it out into the world in all that we think about, do, and say. 
And we thank you for the grace that awaits us in these moments of listening and believing. In Christ's name we thank you. Amen and amen. And so this comes to us as a lectionary reading. And when I use that word lectionary, I simply mean that there was a time when people came to worship every day and on Sunday to hear the word because many people didn't read. They didn't have a Bible in hand. And so in a three-year period, they would hear the entire Bible read from the pulpit. And so this is year A, and next Sunday ends year A. And the first Sunday in Advent, we begin a new year, and that's year B. And so here we are at the second to the last reading. It comes to us from Matthew 25, 14 to 30. And notice that Jesus does not say the kingdom of God is like this, because it's not a parable about the kingdom of God, which is interesting. So hold that thought in your mind, too. Even though in the New King James Version, I think they pop it in, and in parentheses say, we pop this in. And I'm not sure what the logic was, but in most translations, it's not there. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. And at once the one who had received the five talents went off and traded with them and made five more talents. And in the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. And after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. And then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents, and see, I have made five more talents. And his master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, master, you handed over to me two talents and see, I have made two more. And his master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And then the one who had received the one talent also came forward saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter. And so I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here. Have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even then what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him out into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, We hear again from Matthew uh, this week, and again, it's an end time uh, gospel. It's an eschatological message, and when I use that big old fancy church word, basically what that means is it's the last things in the coming of Jesus Christ. That's what all of these readings in the last six weeks or so have been taking us toward. And as I mentioned before, the big C church, that means the big institutional church that includes all of us who believe in the day thousands of years ago, whenever they set the lectionary, they set these readings up so that when we get to the Sunday that is Christ 
as Almighty King, Christ the King. That should be a big celebration for us next week, Christ the King. And by the way, um, Reverend John Creekbaum will be here. I know a lot of you um, really enjoy John, and we'll be having communion too as well. But these lectionary readings are supposed to set us up to celebrate Christ the King, and in doing so, end a season and a time that liturgical year on a theological high note. That's what it's supposed to do. So we're coming to an end of a time, but an end of another time is coming, and we know that. And of course, Jesus is getting his disciples ready for an end of another particular time when he will no longer physically be with them. And he understands what that means. But for us, in this theological time, by the time we gather again after Christ the King on December 3rd, which is the first Sunday in Advent, we're supposed to be able to revisit the hope that Christ has come, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again through all the practices that we have, worship and scripture and sacrament and prayer. Remembering that it's not Christmas on December 3rd, so we're not singing Christmas songs in the four weeks of Advent. I'll just warn you at a time. Because <laughs> it's Advent. It's the season of waiting and preparing so that it gets us ready for Christmas, which happens 12 o'clock on Christmas Eve. But we'll celebrate it at 4 o'clock on Christmas Eve, right? And then gets us ready for Epiphany, which runs all the way to Lent. Epiphany, of course, is taking the good news out into the world. So that's what all of this liturgical stuff is about and what these readings are pointing us to as postmodern people, but I hope something even more deeper. The depth of God's truth in today's scripture should align our thinking and our beliefs to recognize this from what Wendy read in Judges to Thessalonians that was again proclaimed at the font and the gospel story. Recognizing the depths of God's truth and proclaiming what God has done for us, for all of humanity, and what God will continue to do. And that's what Jesus is making a point about. Pay attention to what God has done, God will still do. In a time where you believe maybe God is no longer. And sadly, I think this scripture is only ever used as a way to talk about stewardship and the importance of giving, but most of us already know that. If we receive anything, we know how important it is to give. And if we have that joy in giving, we, we get all that, right? But what's important to recognize in today's story over and above stewardship and the importance of giving is what's not at the center of the story. That's how we can know it's not just a scripture about stewardship. What's not at the center of the story are the two slaves that made all the money. Which, by the way, was such an obscene, vulgar amount of money, it was in the millions, which was ridiculous. And that's, of course, what parables do. It's hyperbole. It shows this incredible situation with these sort of magnified characters, if you will, to make a point. So these good slaves are not at the center of the story. But maybe like you, especially when I was younger, I would read this story and think, what the heck? What's going on? And even though this third slave that the landowner berated hid the money, which by the way, people did then, and I know a lot of people still do today. I had a member of a congregation who told me that his father had a friend who was a sharecropper and he hid all his money in a mattress and never told his wife. And he came home one day and what do you think she was burning out in the backyard because she got a new one. This is a true story. She was burning that mattress. And this particular uh, member of Fountain, his name was Fountain Odom. Don't you love that name, Fountain Odom? He said, my daddy took him in because they didn't have anything then. Everything was in that mattress. He hid it. 
A lot of people still do that. I hear they put them in between pages and books and pockets. You, know, you got to watch, you know, under drawers. People do that. Many people in the time of Jesus did that. And when a person went away, they often would entrust to a friend their money. So they didn't lose it. So what the heck? I mean, the landowner didn't lose any money. Couldn't be happy about that. I mean, he's greedy, he's corrupt, he's mean. Couldn't even be happy, he didn't lose any money. And so Matthew, in this parable, and really if we believe that Jesus is telling it, he sets up the first two slaves as foils in this parable to show us that this third, this third slave is something in which Jesus is making a point. He's making a point with this person and what they did. Because it's really a story about the relationship between the slave and the master, and they represent something. Jesus is using this story to teach his disciples as he's teaching us how to live in the in-between time of the now and what we proclaim as the return of Jesus Christ. That's what next Sunday is about, Christ the King. Come thou, almighty King, we get to sing next week. And Jesus is showing his disciples then how they're going to live now when he's there and when he's physically gone through his power. So it's not just a story about the relationship between the slave and the master. It's a story about the relationship between time and the promises that bring hope, which is what the scripture gives to us. We have the story in Judges. And the people get into trouble, but God still shows up and says, do this, and I will be there to guide you. And then we jump all the way to Paul, who's saying, it's not God's wrath that's after you. It's God's love and grace that's after you. And then we come to this story that suggests something that we're supposed to do with these promises. So we have this story that points to a slave that's driven by fear, and he's living and doing what culturally he knows to be correct. And we shouldn't miss that in this story, at the beginning, Jesus says, each one of these slaves were given talent to what they were able to handle. So it tells us something about this slave. Could handle one thing. And according to the master, couldn't handle it well. But he handled it in the way that he understood it would be safe because he was afraid. And that's the other point of the gospel. And so many Christians I encounter are driven by that same emotion, fear. So many Christians are fearful rather than full of the promises of hope. They're fearful in this in-between time of Christ leaving and Christ returning. And Daniel has a friend who's a... Uh, uh, missionary in um, China who was proclaiming the gospel one time to this gentleman who said, I can't believe that. I can't believe that. You Christians are never happy. <laughs> it's not true, not true. You lie, you lie. That's what the man said. You lie, you lie. Christians are not happy. Let's think about that for a minute. How many of us are driven by fear, that same fear that drives this slave, and the other point of this story is to reveal that the God we face in our mind, in our imagination, in our heart, it's the one we imagine. Think about that. It's the one we imagine. Is it the one of the scripture? Is it the one of truth? How could we imagine that God is the corrupt landowner who would berate us when we get it wrong? Every week, we proclaim the good news of the gospel. Does it say God's going to beat the crap out of you because you got it wrong? No. It doesn't say that, does it? Does that mean we need to go around and get things wrong? It doesn't say that either. Let me share this with you. This is a passage from Forgotten Among the Lilies by Ronald Rollheiser. And by the way, if you have not um, come across this book yet, it is just a gem that can help increase your uh, prayer life and devotion to God. 
and you fall along in the lectionary every day too with many other Christians. But anyway, Ronald writes this, if the faith that I was raised in had a fault, and it did, it was precisely that it did not allow for mistakes. It demanded that you get it right the first time, and there was supposed to be no need for a second chance. If you made a mistake, you lived with it, and like the rich young man, were doomed to be sad, at least for the rest of your life. A serious mistake was a permanent stigmatization, a mark you wore like cane. And I have seen that mark on all kinds of people, divorcees and former clergy and former religious and people who have had abortions and married people who have had affairs and people who have had children outside of marriage and parents who have made serious mistakes with their children and countless others who have made serious mistakes. And we need a theology which teaches us that even though we cannot unscramble an egg, God's grace lets us live happily and with a renewed innocence far beyond any egg we may have scrambled. We need a theology that teaches us that God does just not, excuse me, we need a theology that teaches us that God does not just give us one chance that every time we close a door, God opens another one for us, and that's grace. And as Presbyterians, we proclaim that. If the image of God that we have in our mind, that we proclaim to others, or even that we hide, if you will, is the God of the scripture, that John tells us so loved the world he gave Christ Jesus that we would know the life and the truth and the way who forgives our sin and calls us into responsibility for our spiritual lives is the correct image of God to have, which I believe it is, then we get the message of this parable today. That we can take the mistake that we feel Nobody else can see, we have to hide, we have to pretend we don't have our brokenness and take it to that throne of grace. That's the image of God we should have. And the same to pass on to other people. But what holds us back all the time is fear. Sometimes we can't believe God could ever forget that one mistake. And I'll tell you, that's pride. It's pride. Why couldn't God forgive that? You think you're any different from anybody else? We all make mistakes. The first two slaves in this story had a willingness to resist fear. And if we could look at them as being successful, I think that's what we can point to. And this is why I believe this third slave is held up in the story the way that he is. It's not so much he buried what he did but he couldn't resist the fear associated with risk to go out into the world with what he was given and to allow it to increase. And the truth, is, the truth is, as a disciple in a world that has not come very far from the time of Jesus, we just have different forms of trouble and relative levels of it. Behaving in risky and trusting ways for God and God's kingdom can only occur when we have an image of God, that is everything. Like the image of God in Alice Walker's The Color Purple, where she writes, I believe God is everything. Everything that is or ever was or ever will be. And when you can feel that and be happy to feel that, you found it. You have found God. And when we find this truth, then we believe we have the capacity to imagine entering with joy into the presence of our master, our God, whom we come into this world with. Don't forget that. We come into this world with and by the power of God. How else can we live otherwise? The truth in this parable is as well that Jesus tells it during the midst of his high-risk venture. 
He has come into Jerusalem and understands that his mortal end is near. A new time must come that will and can only be entered into through and by death. And he knows what it has meant to invest his whole mortal life in the will of his father, never opposing that will in his heart. That's what sin is, by the way, opposing the will of God from our heart. He always understood that anything he was ever asked of by the Father was always asked of in love. So imagine when Jesus faces these last days with his disciples, how he might wonder if what he has done, if what he is about to do, and what he hopes and expects after he has gone will be taken and multiplied by his disciples. Or will they bend to fear? and only hide the gift they have been given to protect themselves in the story while they bury it, fearful that if the truth is proclaimed, that they would suffer the fate of Jesus. And of course, many of the apostles we know did, but it didn't stop them. Once they understood it was the power of Christ Jesus through his spirit that worked. And I believe that many Christians today are crippled by that underlying fear. For there are all sorts of ways to die and to suffer for our public proclamation of faith in the scriptures and in God. But we should never let that stop us from proclaiming the truth. I really believe that our greatest risk is whether or not we care deeply enough about anything to take a stand for it or to give our hearts away. We have to ask ourselves, do we avoid that risk by always playing it safe so that we accomplish little or nothing for the kingdom of God or for the love that we believe has sent Christ Jesus into this world? And it's interesting that the kind of fear that's talked about in this parable is actually sloth. Now, I always thought the sloth was like pig pen from Peanuts, you know, Jerry, Charlie Brown. Remember pig pen? I always thought that was sloth. But what it means is not caring or loving or rejoicing or living to the fullest potential of who you are as a person and as a disciple. In other words, to hide, to bury what you have, it's, a, it's called sloth. A lot of people call it a sin, sin of sloth. It's a symptom of sin for sure. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once noted that the sin of respectable people is running from responsibility. And really that kind of a life is a kind of a death, a kind of living in a darkness where everyone and everything else is blamed for the lack of motivated living. And that's what that third slave does blame you, you're a rotten person, I blame you, you're corrupt, I blame you, you take what isn't yours, blame, 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 blame. blame. But really this kind of fear, this slothful fear, that kind of blaming, it's a contempt for human life, for its gifts and for its talents. And if there is one thing that's Satan, and when I say Satan, that's the Hebrew for the accuser. If there is one thing that the accuser is good at, and the scripture tells us this, it's the contempt for human life. So you have a choice. Live on the side of Jesus. You want to live on the side of contempt. And so, friends, although you might think that this parable, and you may have heard this parable, told in a way that builds wealth, builds spiritual wealth. It's a parable that's asking us for what passion and for whom shall we live, fearlessly and courageously. Jesus gave humanity the example of a life lived to the fullest potential of obedience, even in the midst of knowing he would die for it. He didn't shy away due to fear, so that we could have that same strength, that same way, that same truth, that same life. 
Otherwise, it's as though he died in vain. And even for us today, as his disciples, if we choose not to live in that fullness of power within us, we're like the third slave that just went away and buried it because we have this image of God that is so fearful and we're so afraid of making a mistake that we'll get punished if we do the wrong thing. And so the question is, will you take the talent that has been given to you, that has been given to you because you can handle it? And what a gift, what a gift. Will you take that and prayerfully speak to God about how it can be multiplied through and with the power of Christ in you. You don't even have to figure it out. God's already willing to show you the way. Are you willing to trust that? Because the other side of that is to be someone who suffers from a contemptible, slothful fear, thinking it's probably the gift that's not going to do much, and who cares, and who's going to miss it anyway, and who am I? You're someone because you're a child of God that has come into this world with God and for God's purpose. So the choice is yours. And I think it's a beautiful choice to be able to know that as we live to our greatest potential, that we too then can enter with such confidence into the joy of our God, that God celebrates what we're doing with what God has given to us for God's purpose and for joy. And so I hope it ends this season on a high note for you, especially for next week. And as you continue to ponder the ways in which the Holy Spirit may continue to speak to you, not only about this parable, but the other things in your life that you may have been hiding, I invite you to stand and join together in our song of hope, more love to thee. The celebration hymnal, 634, words will be on the screen. Please be seated. Oh, is there a basket? Do you have the basket? Oh, the basket? I didn't bring the basket. Okay. I'll give you a minute. I'm going to give uh, Sandy a minute to bring um, the basket of the pledge card so we can dedicate those to 
as well. Uh, please be sure to add to your prayers the prayer uh, joys and concerns that are listed in the bulletin and those that come to us through the prayer tree too as well. And I thank you for the prayers for my brother. Uh, for this past week, we did uh, make arrangements for him to enter hospice care. So I ask that you'll continue to pray for him and his family too as well. Thank you, Sandy. That's a lot of running around. Huh? Nobody told you, so you wouldn't have known that. Thank you. Please join with me in prayer. Loving and holy God, we thank you and praise you for the gifts that we have been given in this congregation, for the legacy that we have, for the talent, for the time, the energy, the ideas, everything that comes to us through this congregation. We dedicate this to you this morning, not only what was given here in the blessing box and what was given online and throughout this week, but also for the pledges that are given for 2024. We thank you for the faith that people have been given by you to have faith in the ministries, in the mission and the programming that has been entrusted to us. We thank you for those who are wise and thoughtful, and, and I'll say frugal as well, who understand the workings of wealth and money, who understand how we can consider spending it to help people, to relieve need, to leave a legacy, to proclaim the gospel around the world, both here where we live and across the waters into many different lands. And so we dedicate these pledges to you this morning and all of these gifts and entrust the fact that those who use them will be guided by your Holy Spirit, your sense of justice, peace, compassion, and mercy so that the gifts will always be used for the relief of need, the good of people, the good of the church, the good of the world. And we thank you, loving God, that before a word is even across our lips, a prayer formed in our mind or our heart, you are already working in such extraordinary ways. Putting together, I truly believe, all of the right variables, all of the right needs, all of the right things that we can't even see or expect that you understand what is required for the benefit of each of us, understanding that each of us making up this body of Christ matter individually in each moment and collectively through centuries. And we thank you that we have the promises of scripture that tell us that if you have shown up centuries ago for people who felt so abandoned and alone and gotten it so wrong, that you'll show up for us in a world that has so many more comforts and safety nets for most of us, but for many not. And that we will be given the eyes of Christ to see each other as you see us, as our friend Annie admonished us earlier, to see not just the need, but to see Christ Jesus in the person and to be compassionate because Christ has been compassionate to us first. May we see with those eyes, understand with that mind, with the wisdom of the Spirit. Allow the Spirit to speak the words through us that heal and build up and to hear each other as you hear with such wisdom and intelligence that still guides the universe today. May we entrust to you our deepest needs, our deepest joys, our present, our past, and our future. And trust the fact that as we lift it all to you in these moments of prayer, that you take it all into yourself and through the power of your Holy Spirit, that we might trust the fact that in the end, that all shall be made well, all shall be made well, all manner of life within the Alpha and the Omega, Christ Jesus, shall surely be made well. 
and we believe you hear us now in the prayer that Christ Jesus has given to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy will. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My brothers and sisters, as we end our service today, I invite you to stand together, join together in our song of peace. Take my life and let it be. Celebration hymn, the words are on the screen, verses 1, 3, 5, and 6 only. Before I offer the blessing, uh, my brothers and sisters, we'll take about a five-minute break after worship today, give you a chance to get something to drink, use the facilities, and if you're not staying, to be able to leave with some semblance of grace. And so, my brothers and sisters, as we part today, remember that Jesus Christ is within you. The good news is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. Don't hide it. Don't bury it. Take it out into this world and never be afraid. For it is Jesus Christ who strides out before you. He goes ahead of you. He prepares a place for you. He waits there for you. And when you lose your way, I guarantee you, he will turn back on that road to meet you. And I bless you now in the power of our living, loving creator God, our Abba Father, who loves you more than you could ever imagine, who sent Jesus Christ into this world to reveal the truth the life and the way and the power of the Holy Spirit that does have the power to bind you to God and to one another. Hallelujah and amen. Have a beautiful week and a blessed Thanksgiving as well. See you in a short while, friends. There is a light older than the ages. There is light promises of things to come. There is one for our salvation.